So I wonder if in your Bibles you could turn with me to Matthew, to the book of Matthew and to chapter 4, to Matthew chapter 4. Now I'm going to have a brief look at this with the kids and then uh, you guys are going to go off to Sunday school. But before we look at it, I want to ask you a question. What is the darkest place you have ever been? What is the darkest place you've ever been? You've been somewhere really, really, Jeremiah. A ca- have you been into a cave where it's really not really but that's because that's what i was thinking has anyone else been in a cave yeah alvina have you been in a cave and uh did they switch the lights off when you were in there did they do that there were no lights anywhere in there how kind of deep into the cave did you go quite deep and was it very very dark beautiful Beautiful dark. Uh, yeah, oh, really? Total darkness helps you out. Here you go, look. This is a Blue John Cavern in the Peak District, in a place called Castleton in the Peak District. And I, I've been down there. And uh, when you go, they say, listen, this is, you've never experienced this before. This is total darkness, right? There's no natural light down here. And then to prove it, do you know what they do? They turn the lights off. And they say you can tell it's total darkness because you can put your hand in front of your eyes and you can't see it because it's totally, totally dark. And do you know what they do when everyone's got their hands like this in front of their eyes? Do you know what the guy does? He switches the lights back on and laughs at everybody because they're going like that in front of their face. But yeah, there you go. So if you go down Blue John Cavern in the Peak District, they'll switch the lights off and it is the darkest place you've ever been because you can't see anything. Now, I want to just have a quick look at Matthew chapter 4, and he talks about a different kind of darkness to that, and I want you to tell me what the darkness is. He says in verse 16, so we'll just jump in partway through, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, I think if you're going to stay in the sermon, you're going to hear a bit more about this kind of darkness. But I want you to tell me, kids especially, what kind of darkness are the people living in? Are they living in Blue John Cabin in the Peak District? Is that the problem? No, it's not. So what is the darkness that they're living in? Have a think. What is the darkness that they're living in? Even Jeremiah's puzzled, so anyone else? Kyle. Shadow of death. Yeah, brilliant. The shadow of death. That's the next sentence, isn't it? Those living in the land of the shadow of death. Yeah. Anyone want to explain why the shadow of death is like darkness? Let me try and explain it to you. Here we go. We live lives, don't we, which are very short, over which there's the shadow of death, and there is a darkness to living lives in this world. And the darkness is worse because we don't know the God who made us. We don't know the God who made us. We are made to relate to him, to love him, to trust him, to live our lives for his glory. And yet we've become disconnected from him, and we live lives in the shadow of the punishment of death. And it's dark. It's the spiritual equivalent of being in that cave, and you can't even see your hand in front of your face. But, says Matthew, light has come. Someone has switched the lights on, and who does Jesus think they are? Well, he thinks it's him. And what is the light? Well, look down at verse 17. What is the light? What is the light that's come into the cave of darkness? What is the light? Yes, come on, Jeremiah. Jesus is the light. Yeah, Jesus. Jesus is the light. You're right. And specifically, the message of his coming, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus says, turn from the way you're going and turn to me because I'm the light, the one who's come to bring light into the darkness, to free you from the shadow of death, to bring the light of the knowledge of God to your hearts. That's brilliant news. Kids, this is why when you go to Sunday school in a moment, it's really important that you listen and pay attention because there the light is shining in the darkness. 
There the light is shining. Everywhere else is darkness, but when you hear the good news of the gospel about the Lord Jesus Christ, light is shining into your life. So let me pray and ask God to help you in Sunday school, and then you guys can head off, and uh, we will uh, hear a little bit more from God's word. Let's pray for the Sunday school kids. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the great light of the Lord Jesus. Thank you that into the land of darkness, living under the shadow of death, a light has dawned, and that light is Jesus and his message of repentance and a coming kingdom. We pray as the children hear about that in Sunday school, that you might bless them and be with them. We pray that the light might shine into their hearts, and pray that too for us as we listen to your word preached. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, if you're in primary school, it is now your time to go out for Sunday school. I before Neva comes to read us, I'm going to uh, ask Ken to come up just so that he can answer a few questions. Ken, we're going to share this microphone, so I'll stand out of the way. Ken, it's great to have you with us this morning. Can you just introduce us to yourself? Tell us what we need to know about you before you come and preach to us. Give us a brief Okay, well, you, as Steve mentioned, I have, I've been ill a bit, so my voice is not quite up to uh, scratch, but you probably already have recognized I'm an American by, you know, by origin. I was brought up in uh, Massachusetts and I came to study at St. Andrews University uh, here, got married and stayed. Wow. So that was a long time ago, 1976. So I've been here for a while. And um, yeah. And what led a young man in America to come to St. Andrews to study? Uh, it was very old, I'm very much right. older than anything in America. Um, a beautiful place. I wanted to go to another country, uh, wanted to do some postgraduate work. So it all fit, fitted together. Yeah. and. Professor there was well known, and I. You didn't was, anticipate staying. I didn't ant anticipate staying. Thought I'd move back right. and to, to the U.S. Uh, yeah, but I ended up being here and ended up as a pastor of a church. And tell us about East London Tabernacle. I don't know whether some people might have heard of it. Most people probably not. But yeah, tell us. Okay, so it's uh, almost the same distance, the other side of London as you are from Central London, sort of okay. West End. Um, we're just north of Canary Wharf, about two miles or so east of the city. Um, yeah, it's East London Tabernacle. Uh, some people always mistake it for us. Uh, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, which is in South London, off in the castle. They were related right at the beginning because back in 1867, there was a church in Stepney Green looking for a new pastor. And they asked C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, to recommend a minister. And he recommended one of his uh, protégés, just done, been studying under him, called Archibald Brown, uh, had already planted a church in Bromley and Kent. So he came, and God really worked amazing. It was a chapel about this size, and then it was just, uh, it quickly, they, they, God seemed to work. And in fact, one service, about 60 people were converted. Wow. It was a service for young men, a Sunday evening service. And Archibald Brown preached on a text. He preached before, nothing happened from Luke. Uh, young man rise up on the uh, story of the re resurrection of the widow of Nain's son. But he preached that night, and 60 young men were converted and added to the church. And so they relocated to where our present church building is and built a 3,000 seat auditorium, which really for about 30, 40 years was filled every Sunday morning and evening with 3,000 people. And um, it was an amazing work of God went on at that time. Well, it's not that now. Um, 1941, a bomb hit the building and uh, destroyed it. So we got a new building, which is much more usable. Um, but, uh, but, you know, God's been faith faithful and good and the church has continued to flourish. Areas changed a lot. We have about 40% Muslim population living locally. Um, uh, so the whole area has changed a lot, but God's still there. People are being converted. I, I retired two years ago. I was there for 36 years as a pastor and um, retired two years ago. And a guy called Ray Brown is now the minister. He's taken over and the church is going on and they've had baptisms, people added to the church. So right. really encouraging. I guess 40% Muslim is very similar to here. Yeah. What, what have you found, like just in terms of reaching out to the community what have you found to be like the most effective thing to do how have you uh, managed to reach yeah out to i mean the big thing we have had um one of our younger members years ago when i was young now 50 uh, when i he had he had um been a secular youth worker but he wanted to get into christian youth work and so he he began youth work but he wanted the youth work to be really outreach youth work and that has for us means almost complete with muslim young people and so that's been one of the most effective ways over the years. It's taken time, but now it's starting to bear fruit in that he's, he's a lot of one-to-one -one Bible studies going on now. And, and uh, he's got a real reputation in the community as, a, as someone, like, for example, we had a knife, one young, sad, tragically, a, 
uh, teenager was killed by a knife crime behind the church building uh, about a couple of years ago. And the family turned to Andy because he had this reputation yeah. and that, that was good. So it's taken patient, just good work, but he's, and that's been a lot of, you know, a lot of activities, summer camps, um, lots of typical youth work, but always with an aim of getting some of these boys into Bible studies of sorts. And uh, yeah, right. that's been the problem, but lots of other things too we've done. You know, yeah. yeah. This is maybe an impossible question, but if you could distill 36 years of pastoral wisdom into a few sentences for us, what do you think, you know, would be things that you've learned over those years as a, as a pastor? Uh, well, I think the main thing is to keep going at the main thing with that. You know, it's always to get distracted onto all sorts of things and shift it around. Mm. So my, I had a little sort of way, a philosophy of church ministry, which is uh, basically what it, I think what you need is a, let me try to remember it here. Um, uh, the prayerful preaching of God's word with, from within a loving fellowship of God's people. Right. I think that's key. You have a loving fellowship of God's people. I think it's massively, probably the most, the greatest apologetic in the world is just seeing a group of people from like this church and my church, very diverse people who wouldn't normally relate together in the world mm -hmm. together. And within that context, the word being preached prayerfully and faithfully, and then from it, the word going out into the community. I think that's basically what church is about. And I would think you just have to keep your focus on that. Even though churches everywhere will adapt to their context, do different things, to have different emphases, different styles of music, perhaps. But the core thing is, is prayerful preaching of the word within a living, loving fellowship of God's people. Great. Thanks, Ken. I know you've preached here a couple of previous times as well. So yes. once when Paul Pease was yeah. pastor, once when Peter Law was there, yeah, so, yeah. and now when I'm here, so, yeah, yeah, so you've completed the trilogy, yeah, so that's yeah, great. So very yeah. good. Great. Do take a seat, and let's, uh, let's pray for Ken and uh, for us as we listen to God's word, and then Neva's going to come and read Isaiah 8 to 9 for us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for Ken and for Alison. Thank you for them being with us this morning. Thank you just for that testimony of uh, the effectiveness of keeping going with preaching the gospel uh, prayerfully in a loving church family and for you doing your work amongst us and them and then into the community as well please lord we pray that you might make us faithful in that task we pray now as we hear your word read uh, and then explained and taught to us that you might bless us and speak to us by your spirit we pray in jesus name amen Amen. Neva is going to come and read for us from Isaiah uh, chapter 8, verse 19 to 9, verse 7. Neva, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not, ha should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. And when they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upwards will curse their king and their God. Then they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful bloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood and will be destined for burning will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and, and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen. 
Well, it's a great uh, joy and uh, privilege to be with you uh, uh, today. As Steve said, I, I, I have been here before. I do remember preaching uh, uh, here. It was a long, uh, a long time ago, and uh, it's great to be here and to renew fellowship uh, personally, but also in the gospel between uh, churches. And I'll take your greetings back to uh, my church at East London Tabernacle. So please, uh, again, keep your Bible open to, <coughs> excuse me, to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. And uh, following, well, I'm sure as you're aware, uh, the, we're in the Advent season leading up to Christmas, the evidence all around, the decorations here, the Christmas tree, all the events being planned today and over the next uh, few weeks. But Advent's more than just simply the, the, the run up to Christmas. Uh, traditionally, Advent is a time when Christians anticipate celebrating the first coming of Jesus in his birth at Bethlehem by looking forward to his second coming at the end of the age. Now, from our perspective on this side of the first coming of Jesus, those two comings look very, very distinct. In his first coming, the Son of God came in humility as he was born of the Virgin Mary. And he went on to live and to suffer and to die. And then having died for our sins, Jesus then was raised to life and exalted to the right hand of the Father, where now he reigns over all things until he comes again in power and glory. However, if you were a believer before the first coming of Jesus, both those comings would really look like one future event, it's like looking at a mountain range. It looks like one big mountain until you get into it and you realize different ridges, different mountains, different valleys, and so on. Now, the Old Testament prophets spoke of a, a future coming of God to rescue his people and to bring his kingdom of righteousness and peace. And the Old Testament believers look forward with hope to that future event. And even in the darkest times, that hope sustained those who believed in God's promise. Today, as believers in Jesus, we can see and rejoice how God has kept his promise to his old covenant people, Israel, in the first coming of Jesus, even as now we look forward to him keeping his promise when Jesus will return in power and in glory at his second coming. Now, one of the prophets to whom God revealed his promise to send a king to rescue his people and establish his kingdom was the prophet Isaiah. Uh, the passage we're looking at this morning is one of the best known ones <clears throat> in the book that bears Isaiah's name. This passage, or part of it at least, is read almost every Christmas. It's going to be read this afternoon, which is good uh, to hear. However, I think it is unfortunate that sometimes it's read <clears throat> with only verses 2 and then verses 6 and 7, and so much of the rest is left out. Now, in a nativity service or family service, that's really understandable because you can't really immediately get things across uh, like that. But we do need sometimes to hear, get the whole passage so that we really understand what God has been saying through Isaiah. And taken as a whole, this passage enlarges our, our understanding of what God has done and how he works to accomplish his purpose to save not only believers from his old covenant people, Israel, but also believers in his promise of salvation from all nations on earth, people like you and me who believe in Jesus. And what I want us to do this morning <clears throat> is for us to reflect on this passage so that we can marvel at the greatness of the salvation that has dawned like the rising sun on our dark world. When this child, this child was born to us in Bethlehem. And as we do, we will more fully appreciate the significance of this child, this infant, for our lives in this world. And I trust be filled with wonder, filled with hope, filled with just amazement as we wait for Jesus to come again and for his kingdom to come in all its fullness. So I have three points. My first one is this, or inside your, your bulletin, if you want to follow uh, that way. The first is this, uh, the darkness in which people live within this world, the darkness in which people live within this world. Why did Jesus <clears throat> have to be born in Bethlehem? Why did he come into uh, this world? Why was it necessary for the Son of God who existed eternally with the Father and the Spirit as the one God to be sent by the Father and conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary so that nine months later, 
he was born in Bethlehem. Well, the reason was our desperate spiritual state. As human beings, we are people walking in darkness, as verse 2 of, verse, of chapter 9 puts it. Because of sin, we live in moral and spiritual darkness, as Steve was saying earlier, to the children. Not the physical darkness of a cave or anything like that, but moral and spiritual darkness. Oh, we might think that we are very enlightened, but the reality is that, to use the words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, we are darkened in our understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in us due to the hardening of our hearts. And in chapter 8, verses 19 to 22, Isaiah paints a very vivid, very powerful, very disturbing picture of this moral and spiritual darkness. And listen to what he says. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction <clears throat> and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to the word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they roam through the land. When they're famished, they will become enraged and looking upwards, will curse their king and their God. And then they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into outer darkness. The picture here is of people who are utterly confused, utterly bewildered, because they refuse to listen to what God says in his word. Rather than consult God, they consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter. It seems that in Isaiah's day, people in Judah were turning away from God's word and turning to various <clears throat> forms of magic and the occult of one kind or another. And unlike God who speaks loudly and clearly in his words, these mediums, these spiritists were, were, conf were obscure. They were, conf they were confusing to people. And as such, the people, especially those who teach them, have no right light of dawn. So they were distressed, hungry, famished, enraged, and looking up to earthly authorities and further up to God himself in heaven, they curse. And as they look around, they see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and the prospect of being thrust into utter darkness when they die, being under the shadow of death, this terrible shadow that just overwhelms everything, blocks out the light, and living under the shadow of death. My friends, what an utterly dark picture Isaiah paints for us here. Uh, and, isn't, and isn't that the moral and spiritual condition of people of our day, just as it was in Isaiah's day. This is the human condition of humanity as sinners. People may or may not literally engage in occult practices. Sadly, that's what many do, whether they read horoscope, their horoscopes every day, or worse, engage in more sinister, darker forms of, of magic. But even if people don't do that, they're living in moral and spiritual darkness. Refusing to listen to God and what he says in his word, they turn to other sources to find direction in life. Just as we we're leaving today, a guy was arriving in a sort of Buddhist outfit next door. We have a, uh, our next door neighbor has a, our, what they call a Dharma shed, a Buddhist meditation hut in his garden. And people come from all over the place. So confused, they can't find it. They're not listening to, uh, to, to God. And they're looking to other sources, Buddhism, other things for direction in life. And today, as we see the decreasing influence of Christianity in our culture, we see this happening. That's why uh, that's what's happening as people discuss the whole issue of human sexuality. Rather than listening to what the Bible says about what it means to be male and female and all that means for our human flourishing as God intends, people say and turn to other things and try to find wisdom from themselves, from within themselves. And of course, all that's a lie. But many believe this lie. It's even being taught, sadly, to our children in schools. Now, that's just one hot button issue, but the reality is that by refusing to consult God's instruction and the testimony, ordinary people are morally confused and living in the dark, the spiritual dark, of what is right and wrong. And increasingly, we see this in the breakdown of the family and abusive relationships, in lying and deceitfulness. In private or in public, dishonesty at, at work, 
and so much more. And at the root of it all is our sinful rebellion against God. It all went wrong when Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden. And it continues to go wrong as each of us rebel against God. And the rebellion may not express itself in the sin described here. Some of us may rebel like the younger son in Jesus' story. Go into the far country, there where we squander our wealth on wild living. Others may be more like that older brother who stayed at home and obeyed all the rules, but not out of love for his father. Religiously and morally upright people are just as much sinners as moral reprobates. But in whatever way we express our rebellion, we're all sinners. We're all sinners living in moral and spiritual darkness. We don't know the God who would save us. That's not something people want to hear, something people need to hear. The Bible is brutally honest. And this dark picture it, picture it paints for us of people walking, people living in darkness. And if we understand the good news of Jesus Christ, we need to first understand that. But that brings me to the second point, the infant who was brought light into this world, the infant who was brought light into this world. The good news is there in verse two, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And what is this light that has dawned on a morally and spiritually dark world? Well, as Jeremiah said, it's Jesus. The light is the Lord Jesus. The light began to shine when Jesus was born and it became brighter and brighter and brighter as he grew up and as he lived in Galilee. Indeed, in the passage we read earlier from Matthew 4, uh, Matthew quotes verse 1 in describing the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. A light beginning to shine in the darkness. Jesus was born in Bethlehem to bring light into our darkness. And it's in that light that we begin to see the greatness of our sin, but also in that light we begin to see the greatness of our salvation. And to help us understand the greatness of our salvation and the light that that brings, we're going to look more closely at the four names or titles that was given to this infant, this child who was born in Bethlehem. And the first one is this, this infant is called Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful Counselor. What is a counselor? Well, a counselor is a, is a close and trusted friend who comes alongside us to impart wisdom, to give us advice, to encourage us, to, to comfort us, to help us. Perhaps you have a friend uh, like that. In the Old Testament, such a counselor was often associated uh, with one of the kings of Israel. But here, it's the infant, the child, who is the king. And he is the one who is wise and gives counsel to those who trust in him. How he does this is beautifully described in another passage that Isaiah uh, writes in chapter one, uh, chapter 11, I mean, verse one, a shoot will come up out of the stump of Jesse. Jesse, of course, was David's father. And from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge of the Lord, <clears throat> and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. In his humanity, Jesus was anointed with the spirit as his earthly ministry bore witness. And now exalted to the right hand of the Father, he continues to impart witness, uh, <clears throat> sorry, counsel and wisdom as our counselor by the Holy Spirit that he, who he gives us. By the Spirit, Jesus comes alongside us as our, as our friend, as our counselor, to counsel us as we live in this world. And he does so as he enables us to understand his word and to apply that word to our lives. He also encourages us and comforts us in our heart. He gives us peace unlike anything that this world can give. The Holy Spirit is indeed, as Jesus said, another counselor, another advocate. Another friend to come alongside, <clears throat> who comes alongside us as Jesus himself did with his own disciples, to give us counsel. As counselor, Jesus is truly wonderful, wonderful. His counsel is marvelous and full of wonder. Anyone who knows the Bible and begins to read it just knows just how wonderful the counsel of Jesus is. But it's more than that. The child who is born is himself a wonder as our counselor. 
One of the great commentators on the book of Isaiah is a man called E.J. Young, and he put it this way, not merely is the Messiah wonderful, but he himself is a wonder through and through. His very being in person is a wonder. He is that that surpasses human thought and power. He is God himself. Oh, my friends, never forget how wonderful Jesus is in the fullest, richest, and deepest sense of the word. And let yourself be lost at this Christmas time in wonder and love and praise at such a Savior. And then secondly, we see that Jesus, or this infant, is called mighty God. Jesus is the incarnate, the enfleshed Son of God. He is the eternal word of the Father who has made flesh for our salvation. Now, for sure, Jesus is fully human, as human as you and I are, except without our sin. He was born as every human being has ever been born, and he lived as any human being has ever lived. And yet he was fully God. And as God, he is God in every sense of the word that God is God. And not least, he is mighty or powerful, as only God is mighty and powerful, which means that Jesus uh, can, can do what only God can do. And that is to save sinners like us. As sinful mortals, we can't save ourselves. There's nothing. We've been singing of that. There's just nothing that we can do to save ourselves. Only God can save sinners like us. And that is what he has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, God himself has come in our human flesh to rescue us from the consequences of our sins and to bring us into his eternal kingdom. In his life, in his death, His resurrection, the Lord Jesus is mighty, powerful in saving sinners. And yet how was that might exercised? It was exercised in the weakness of the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross. And yet it was in the death of the incarnate Son of God that God saves sinners who trust in him. And he saves us not only when we first believe, but he saves us right through our lives until we reach glory. As another prophet, the prophet Jonah says, salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation comes from the Lord. And thirdly, we see that the infant is called everlasting father. Now, if Jesus is the son of God, how can he be everlasting father? Does Isaiah mean that Jesus and the father are really identical? Well, he doesn't mean that. Of course, in the Old Testament, the distinction between the father and the son is not as clearly revealed to us as it is in the New Testament. And in part, what Isaiah means is that as the Messiah, Jesus is father-like in relating to us as our Savior. And so as God come to save us, Jesus is, as Isaiah puts it in chapter 63, our Father, our Redeemer from of old. Or it's put in Psalm 103. He he is like a father who has compassion on his children. He's father-like. But as the everlasting Father, Jesus is also the one who reveals the Father to us. Listen to the response Jesus made to one of his disciples, Philip. When Philip questioned him and, you know, the disciples still don't fully understand everything about Jesus, even at the point where he's about to go to his death on the cross. And Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. This is uh, uh, John 14, verse 8. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. and That will be enough for us. And Jesus says, don't you know me, Philip, that even, at, <clears throat> even after I've been with you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not, I, 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 I speak not, are not the own, sorry, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Jesus reveals the Father uh, to us. And because they are distinct persons, and yet one God, the Father is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why uh, Jesus, uh, or said of Jesus in John chapter uh, 1, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Jesus reveals the Father, eternally begotten of the Father. Jesus is the image of the invisible God and reveals him to us as his beloved Son. 
which brings us fourthly to see that this infant is called the Prince of Peace. Now as the Prince of Peace, Jesus exercises his royal authority to accomplish peace. Because of sin, there's enmity between us as human beings and God. As sinful human beings, we're at war with God. That's how serious it is. We're at war with, with God. But on the cross, the Lord Jesus makes peace by shedding his blood. His sacrifice atoned for our sins by turning away God's wrath from us that we so rightly deserve and reconciled us, made peace between us and with God. The war came to an end through the reconciling work of Jesus on the cross, accepted and forgiven by God, that is justified through faith in him, we now have peace with God. The war has ended. No longer is God the judge who condemns us, but rather the Father who accepts us and welcomes us, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his mercy for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. His peace that we now have is the, the peace of God that transcends all understanding, guards and keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, whatever our circumstances in this world, no matter how unpeaceful it is all around us, we have this peace with God that's beyond anything we can understand, anything that this world can give. But the peace that we now have with God that's in our hearts and minds is only the beginning. Because ultimately, God's purpose is to bring is that his whole creation will be renewed and filled with peace and all that we look forward to we do so with hope but right now right now we have peace with god and we do so because jesus is the prince of peace that brings us then thirdly and finally to see that the kingdom that will last forever beyond this world, the kingdom that will last forever beyond this world, the child who was born in Bethlehem is the sovereign Lord of whose government of peace there will be no end, verse 7. Now in keeping with God's promise to, to David, King Jesus will reign over an eternal kingdom of peace forever. Ever. God promised with David that one of his sons would reign forever, and that son, that descendant, is Jesus and his kingdom of justice and peace will be forever. And what a glorious kingdom it will be when it comes in its fullness. Again, over in chapter 11, uh, verse three, he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will make decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt, his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, and the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Oh, my friends, that is our hope as Christians. That is our hope as Christians. In a world as troubled as ours, and how troubled it is, and how aware we are of that this Christmas, in a world in which there's so much injustice and so much conflict, so much crime and disorder, what a wonderful hope this is. And there should be no doubt that this kingdom will come because the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish. God is zealous, zealous with all it is to be God to accomplish his purpose, to bring this kingdom of peace. But even now, this kingdom comes in the world as the gospel is proclaimed and people like us repent and believe in Jesus and joyfully submit as individuals and as churches to the sovereign, his sovereign rule. The question is, is how was the kingdom of the Lord Jesus established? So it comes not only in this present world, but beyond it in the world to come. Well, it wasn't established like the kingdoms of this world. In this world, the kingdoms are established through political and military and economic and cultural power and often with violence. Well, that's not how it is with the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. Now, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus was established through weakness. 
That's why we need to understand, and to be understand this, we're reminded in verses three to five of what happened in the day of Midian's defeat. You may have wondered, why, why is that thrown in in the middle of this passage? What's all this about the day of Midian's defeat? Well, it's a reference back to the book of Judges, chapter 7, when God delivered Israel from the Midianites by 300 men led by Gideon. You might remember Gideon, the guy didn't lack much confidence. God said, you're going to lead my people to victory over the Midianites who are taking over the land. He has 32,000 men, but he whittles it down, 10,000, then from 10,000 down to 300. And it's with those 300 men that Gideon goes into battle against the Midianites, and God gives us an amazing victory. Now, in a far greater way, God has delivered us from a far greater enemy, the enemy of sin, the enemy of death, the enemy of, who is the devil. Through that infant who was born in weakness in Bethlehem, and who as an adult 33 years later died in weakness on the cross at Calvary. And today the kingdom of King Jesus is established in our lives and in our churches and in our world as we fight the good fight in our weakness, but trusting in him to work powerfully through us by the Holy Spirit in the gospel. So here then are a few thoughts from this well-known passage as we enter into this Advent season. And I trust that, we, <clears throat> that what we have considered has enlarged your understanding and appreciation of what you're celebrating, what we're all celebrating at this time of year. Away with all the sentimentality, so much that passes for Christmas. In the spiritual and moral darkness of our world, we are celebrating the dawning of the light of salvation. We are celebrating Jesus, who was the child, the infant who was born to us, and the son who was given to us for our salvation when we were lost in the darkness of sin. We are celebrating Jesus, who is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. We are celebrating Jesus, the greatness of whose government and peace will never, never, never end. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do have indeed so much to celebrate at this Christmas time. And as we prepare for that, through this Advent season, Lord, we're amazed at what you've done in this dark, dark world. A dark world of which we, if we were Christians, once were part. A light has dawned in your Son, the Lord Jesus, born as that infant in Bethlehem, born to grow up, to have his ministry and then to die and rise again for our salvation and to do so in weakness, the weakness of the cross. And yet there, as in the day of Midian's defeat, you defeated sin and death and the devil. And now Jesus was gloriously raised in power. And we, Lord, trusting in him, know one day we will be raised in power. We will enjoy his kingdom of peace forever and ever. We praise you for this hope. And Lord, give us opportunity to share this hope with others. Uh, to invite people this afternoon and through this whole Christmas season to learn this great message, ourselves to exemplify this as we live it out in our lives. And Father, we pray that if any among us this morning do not have this hope and do not know this Jesus, that in your mercy will break through the darkness and the light would dawn, they will see that in that infant is their salvation. We pray all this in his name. Amen.